Welcome to the Falkland Islands, where I've been for the last few days in an attempt to fly over the world's largest iceberg. There's been some pretty horrendous weather delays. As you can see, that weather's changed. And yesterday we had an incredible opportunity to fly with the RAF to patrol around these islands way out over this iceberg and see it for the first time. For the next 20 minutes, we'll be taking your questions on the iceberg, on anything else related to Antarctica while we're here. Um, there's a QR code on your screen, so um, if you follow that, you can send some questions live. I'll be answering them. We've had lots already so far, so I'm going to start cracking through them. And first up, we've got one from True Chaotix here. This is probably a silly question. There's no such thing as a silly question, I don't think. But could the ice not somehow be collected to help with countries suffering severe drought or forest fire rather than it being wasted in the sea? It's not actually a silly question because lots of people have proposed this as a serious solution to drought and things like that. The UAE most recently has said, you know, why can't we tow icebergs from the Antarctic up to arid zones and use that water? And this iceberg that we've flown over, it's 40 miles across. It's a trillion tonnes of ice, trillion tonnes of water. That's a massive resource. But when you start looking at the practicalities, it gets more tricky. These things are enormous ocean currents can take them in all sorts of directions as can winds so just towing something that big would be hugely problematic and extremely expensive in terms of fuel and when you factor all that in it's probably easier just to run a desalination plant or something where you are to generate that fresh water and even if you were to move it how do you then take you know solid ice melt it down and get it into a municipal water supply and even though it is pristine frozen fresh water from Antarctica, it probably still would need treatment before you give it to humans. So factor all those things in, it's not particularly economically viable. That's probably why we haven't seen it happen before, but it has been considered. Now, Bob G asks, when ice melts, will it release harmful ancient gases into the atmosphere? Well, actually, as Bob may well know, there is gas trapped in glacial ice because it's formed by snow falling on the Antarctic continent. And there's a lot of air in that snow when it falls and that's compressed by more snow and you get pockets of compressed gas, tiny little bubbles inside icebergs. You can even hear it cracking out when they break up. I've heard it close to carving glaciers, but it's pretty small amounts of gas really. And the gases that were in the atmosphere even millions of years ago, and some of these icebergs do go back those kinds of ages, are just the same as the ones now. So it's not really a toxicity problem. I think it more raises the question about the gases we're putting into the atmosphere right now, carbon dioxide, chief among them, that is causing the rapid global warming we're seeing at the moment, that is actually accelerating the loss of ice from Antarctica. A little aside, interestingly, they actually use those gases trapped in glaciers, in those bubbles, to study ancient climates. And it's through that sort of analysis that we know how rapidly CO2 is rising in our atmosphere now compared to what it was doing in previous parts of our history, even when Antarctica had trees on it, back when it was much, much warmer, even though they had higher CO2 in the atmosphere, we've never see seen it rise as quickly as we are now. Nigel has a question. Hi Tom, if the megaberg does threaten the penguins and other sea creatures, habitats, food chains, are there any plans to use explosives or other human interventions? The ethical dilemmas surrounding that must be up for debate. They certainly would be, I think, if someone was thinking of blowing up icebergs. But I, think, I suppose it's important to remember this is a natural process. These glaciers, these big icebergs, have been carving off the ice sheets of the, uh, the ice shelves, I should say. There's a difference. We'll come on to that in a bit. The ice shelves of Antarctica, since, you know, since it's been covered in ice, it's part of a natural process. The courses the, these, iceberg takes, these icebergs take are natural too. Yes, it does prevent, present a potential hazard to wildlife and to shipping, but I think most people would agree it's just part of the natural dynamics of this really spectacular and ever-changing Antarctic marine environment that happens down there. And um, it's, just, it's just one of those things that happens and, and, and the wildlife will have to sort of make around it just as they have to contend with bad weather or fluctuations in their food supplies. And also, as you say, ethically speaking, if you were to do something about it, you'd probably end up creating more problems than you solve. If you blow up an iceberg, you make it the smaller bits and it's actually the small bits that are more likely to endanger wildlife. And as we were discussing with the water use thing, if you're towing them around, you're burning tons of fuel and risking environmental pollution. So probably just 
unfortunately one of those things you have to just sit and watch and see what happens and hopefully you can understand a little bit more about what happens to animal populations when, when these events occur. And, and there are a large number of scientists, the British Antarctic Survey and the government scientists down here with the government of South Georgia who will be studying this iceberg very closely to see exactly what kind of impact it has. Simon B asks, how do you work out it's only a trillion tonnes unless you've mapped the underside of the whole thing at a depth of the uh, height above the sea and seven times is the, sort of the, the, the rule of thumb when icebergs are floating on the sea? The honest answer is that number is a guesstimate. It's an estimate based on the width of the berg and the estimated height of the berg. Because it's such a big slab of ice, it will sit in the water differently to your average iceberg. It is, is how I understand it. But yeah, um, I think they're estimating about two times the depth below the sea as above. We've got a pretty clear indication at least of, of how deep one corner of it is, it is at least, because it's run aground in an ocean about 200 metres deep off the uh, rocky shelf of South Georgia. So that gives them a pretty clear indication. It was about 200 metres below um, the water. And the, the, the estimate, and it is a crude estimate, stands at about a trillion tonnes. But I should say that figure's probably dropping every minute, as we saw when we were flying over that iceberg. Huge, huge chunks of it. You know, millions of tons worth are probably dropping off it every day. And that will continue. It'll slow slightly as we get into the Antarctic um, winter, which is coming up uh, in the coming few months. But the ocean around there is significantly warmer than the ocean it was born in down in uh, Antarctica. So it is inevitably going to melt pretty rapidly and break up. Marky asks, when the iceberg melts, what effect will this have on the environment? What can be done to minimise any impact? Again, there's not much we can do to minimise it, and I don't think anyone would propose doing that. It just wouldn't achieve anything. But in terms of the impacts, that's something that's you know, actively being studied. One thing we definitely know happens is all of that trillion tonnes of ice in the berg, when it melts, that's a trillion tonnes of fresh water going into salty seawater. And it doesn't dissolve straight away. It's actually much less dense than salty seawater, fresh water. So it floats along the surface. That has two potential impacts. One, it pushes the food that things like penguins and seals feed on lower down in the water column, potentially making it harder for them to access. Um, but it could also, when you have huge influx of water like this, it can disrupt large ocean currents. And that's one thing we're already seeing around the Antarctic continent. You know, a good 900 miles further south than where this iceberg is. But there's so much water melting off Antarctica at the moment due to our warming climate. There is a suggestion that it's going to help slow down something called the Arctic Circumpolar Current, which is crucial actually in maintaining the Earth's temperature balance. It's the current that takes a lot of the warmth in the ocean that's put there in the tropics. It's carried down on ocean currents and it sinks it down deep, deep into the ocean. Sometimes for thousands, tens of thousands of years, that warmer water is sunk down and cooled down in the process. It's a bit like an air conditioning system for the planet. Some concern that might be slowing down as more and more fresh water goes in. This one iceberg, even a trillion tons, won't have a, a global impact like that. It'll be a very localized one, but it's, it's an example of the sorts of knock-on effects that can happen. Posty Quinn one asks, if the iceberg melts, what impact will this have on sea levels? This is a really important and a good question too. And the answer is none. Uh, because icebergs, and this iceberg came from an ice shelf that is a, 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 a glacier that's come down off Antarctica that's floating on the sea already. So the ice has come off the continent, but as soon as it starts floating on the ocean, it's already made its contribution to sea level rise. And here's why. When you put an, an, an ice cube in your drink of water, it displaces its volume of water straight away because ice is less dense than water. That's why ice cubes float. And as they melt, they won't contribute any further to the amount of water in the glass. They've already done that when they plop in there because they're displacing their volume of water as we, some of us, learned in science way back when and might have forgotten. But an iceberg itself won't contribute to sea level rise but obviously, as more ice comes off the Antarctic continent, it is contributing to sea level rise. So once it gets onto the ocean, it's doing its thing. 
And in terms of the amount of sea level rise we're talking about, there was another question about this uh, as well. Um, sea level was rising in the order of millimetres a year due to the melting of Antarctica right now, even though we're seeing an accelerated melt. But as the planet warms, that's projected to, to increase exponentially, effectively, maybe up to about five centimetres, centimetres a year when it reaches its maximum. That's not coming for many decades from now. Scientists predict, and this is based again on estimates of basically what we're seeing in the warming and how the Antarctic is responding, we might be see about two metres of sea level rise by the end of this century and up to five metres by 2150. If all of Antarctica was to melt, and in most climate scenarios that we see, that won't happen. It's simply too big and the, the planet isn't expected to warm beyond you know, three and a half, four degrees. We wouldn't see it all melt. But if it was, there's about 58 metres worth of sea of water stored on Antarctica. It would contribute to 58 metres of sea level rise if it was to melt entirely across the entire continent. Chris H asks, how responsible is CO2 or other human factors in global warming and climate change and what evidence is there? Well, there's overwhelming evidence and a, and a, and a global consensus of scientists that CO2 is driving global warming. We've seen that in the past, that's what caused previous warm episodes in the Earth's history. But what we've also been able to establish, what scientists have been able to establish in more recent decades, is how much human generated, anthropogenic, human made carbon dioxide sources and other greenhouse gases like methane are contributing to global warming. And there's really little doubt now that, that there is a strong anthropogenic human CO2 signal. That is what's causing this rapid rate of warming. Like I was saying before, you know, we've looked back using some of this Antarctic ice actually to study ancient atmospheres. We know there were higher CO2 levels way, way, way back hundreds of millions of years ago. There used to be plants growing on Antarctica. But what's alarming is the speed at which we're seeing the increase in CO2. That's something that hasn't happened in, his, in, in the history of the Earth. And that's why scientists are concerned about what we're doing and what impact it has not on the planet system as a whole. We, it's been through things like this in the past, but our species and the species we currently share our planet with, they haven't. And that's what the concern is about. And that's why scientists take global warming as seriously as they do. And they're asking politicians to do the same. Now, here's a good one. How did the iceberg, this is from Andre, how did the iceberg get its names? Do icebergs get named like storms? And they do. Um, it's something I only learned quite recently. Depending on what sector of the Antarctic, the Antarctic continents divided up into quadrants, depending on what quadrant they come from, they get a letter, A, B, C, as, as it goes round, and then a number based on what sequence of icebergs broke off that particular bit of the quadrant. So A23A came from the A sector, which was the Rona Felschner ice shelf that sticks out into the Weddell Sea. That's in the, the same quadrant that's closest to where we are here and in South, and South Georgia. It's where British Antarctic Survey's um, bases are. And it's a big, big ice shelf. Lots of icebergs come from there. Uh, A23A is big, but it's not the biggest there's ever been, actually. There was one called B15 that broke off, I think, in the year 2000. It was almost three times bigger than A23A. Uh, and it spent quite a long time in a, in a large chunk. Big bits of it broke off. And then I believe in 2024, they were still tracking a much, much smaller fragment of that B15 iceberg. And as, as they break up, they're given sub letters. So A23A is a piece that broke off a much bigger A23A back in 1980 something. Um, uh, but they're still tracking a, a smaller bit of B15. So these things have very long histories. And yeah, they do name them so they can track them because scientists want, us, want to understand how these icebergs behave. Interestingly, uh, though, B15 and A23 and, and a one more recently, I think it was A76, they all follow a very similar, or well, a lot of them follow a very similar track and quite a few of them end up in almost exactly the same place as we saw A23A yesterday, run aground off South Georgia. So it's, it's, it's like a, um, an iceberg superhighway running up to that part of Antarctica. Um, Jane McStanley asks, can we explain more about what ocean scour is when the iceberg scrapes the seafloor? Um, yeah, that's what's happening here in uh, South Georgia. The icebergs run aground and it'll be gouging the seabed. Now, that has a very local impact. There's, although not a lot of people realise this because they're familiar with tropical oceans, there are corals down in the Antarctic Ocean, sea fans, sort of really valuable 
marine habitat that gets completely obliterated by an iceberg. And that's a bad thing, but the, obviously these, these seafloor environments around here, that's all part of their natural ecology. They're used to dealing with it. And that scouring effect, although it has a negative impact in terms of what's living down there being scoured, it churns up a lot of sediment and there's sediment in the iceberg itself and that can actually put nutrients into the ocean and what they've also seen with icebergs in the past as well as potential impacts on wildlife they've also seen the oceans being fertilized and more food available for the krill for example that is fed on by penguins and by fish and by whales which are then in turn the fish and things eaten by seals so it can actually have a boosting effect some people think where did the iceberg come originally from originally? Um, someone's asking, well, that was, I've, I've just mentioned that, the Ronner Filchner Ice Shelf. But incredibly, it broke off there in 1986, nearly 40 years ago. It got stuck for a long time and it's then had a meandering journey north uh, to get to where it is. So it was incredible yesterday to see this thing that's been around since I was a teenager, uh, you know, still there, this vast block of ice. Although now I think it's fate sealed, it's gonna melt pretty quickly. So it hasn't got much longer to be around. And Biscuit asks, how many more icebergs would we have to melt before we see noticeable sea level rise? Well, we did touch on that a minute ago. We're already seeing sea level rise of the order of millimetres a year due to the melting of Antarctica and millimetres again due to the melting of Greenland, which is the other big contributor, the other big sort of ice covered bit of the world way up in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're going to see that uh, uh, continue noticeable depends how you measure it but before, i think before most of us it won't be till the end of the so the middle of this century that we're going to see tens of centimeters of sea level rise and as i was saying before worst case scenario worst prediction maybe two meters of sea level rise by the end of this century one final question i think i've got a few minutes for that maybe one jonathan b how far will it travel before it melts i think it's kind of unless it breaks free from where it's running around in south georgia I think this one's a goner. It's, uh, it was already breaking up quite a lot when we flew over it and the ocean around here is much warmer so it's probably going to uh, break up really quite swiftly indeed. And uh, gosh, there's a few more. I, have I got a second? I'm just looking to my... We've got time for one more question. I'm just pausing here because I'm trying to get... Amber asked me, does the scale of it scare me? It didn't, it, it actually, it just blew my mind. It was, in, it was incredible. It was just amazing to see. I think what does scare me a little bit, although this iceberg itself didn't break off because of climate change, it's a natural process. It is emblematic of a very rapid increase in ice loss from Antarctica. It's losing about 150 billion tonnes of ice a year as our planet warms. And about half of that is due to icebergs breaking away. So I think that scares me. But seeing the iceberg itself was just truly awe-inspiring. So I'm afraid that is it. We've run out of time. But um, thank you very much for joining us. And um, farewell from a very unusually sunny Falkland Islands. Really sunny, uh, unusual since we've been here. Thanks very much for joining us.